the Leon Panetta 2015 Lecture Series, The Test of Leadership in 2015, Critical Issues That Can Unite or Divide America. This lecture discusses cyber. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Sylvia Panetta. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Monterey Conference Center in beautiful Monterey by the Bay for the fourth and final lecture in the 18th annual Leon Panetta Lecture Series. It's been 18 years. As you know, our theme this year has been critical issues that can unite or divide America. We've discussed energy, we've discussed race relations, and we've discussed the economy. Challenges that indeed we've had to confront throughout America's history. But tonight's subject, cyber, is unique in that it is a new challenge that has emerged as a direct result of the revolutionary technological innovations related to the creation of the Internet and the development of cyberspace. Sixty years ago, new technology launched the globe into a nuclear arms race. Today, we're facing a new kind of global armament as nations, industry, criminals, terrorists, and activists manipulate new technologies for their own purposes and their own objectives. Most frightening is our level of dependence on this technology. Households, companies, financial institutions, the military, and federal and state governments are reliant on the Internet to perform daily functions, making every American household, and thus our society as a whole, vulnerable to cyber threats. How can we protect ourselves from an enemy that cannot be seen, that is difficult to trace, that crosses borders, hides behind false identities, and when found, can adapt almost instantly? Are we engaged in a new kind of warfare? And if so, what are the rules of engagement? How can we know where the threats are coming from in order to protect our nation and our way of life? Is our military sufficiently prepared for a potential attack? Can the business world protect consumer data and information so that our economy can continue to function? What about questions of privacy? As we continue to share greater and greater amounts of information online, can we create assurances that this information remains secure and private? The rise of the Internet has intertwined the global community in a way that was never before possible. But it has also made all of us extraordinarily vulnerable. We must find the right balance between protecting our security and safeguarding our freedoms. Cyber threats are complex and ever-changing. The solutions must show, show equal levels of adaptability and innovation. Tonight, Leon will ask what shape th these solutions should take and how they can be most successful in a discussion with three leading experts on cyber, on the tech industry, and on our national defense. Our first guest is considered one of our nation's most influential chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As the 17th chairman, he was the principal military advisor to Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, as well as to the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Council. Serving from 2007 to 2011, he oversaw the end of the combat mission in Iraq and the development of a new military strategy for Afghanistan. He advocated for the rapid development and fielding of innovative technologies, championed emerging and enduring international partnerships, and advanced new methods for combating terrorism. Please welcome Admiral Mike Mullen. Our second guest has broad knowledge of the computing industry that spans hardware, manufacturing, security, and software. She has spent more than 25 years at Intel Corporation. 
There, she spearheaded the company's expansion into providing proprietary and open source software and services for applications in enterprise, security, and cloud-based computing. She was named president in 2013. She is also vice chair of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. There, she advises the United States President on a variety of policy issues, including infrastructure protection, national security, emergency preparedness, just to name some. Please welcome Renee James. Thank you. Hello. Our final guest has dedicated his career to securing the nation's safety at home and abroad. A retired four-star general, he was the longest serving director of the NSA and was responsible for national and foreign intelligence requirements, military combat support, and national security information system protection. In 2010, he was inaugurated as the first commander of United States Cyber Command. He served when Leon was Secretary of Defense. As commander, he planned, coordinated, and conducted operations defending the Department of Defense computer networks, as well as providing national defense from cyber attacks. Please welcome General Keith Alexander. Moderating the discussion is the former director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense. He has described this topic of cyber as, quote, the thing that kept me up at night when I was Secretary of Defense, unquote. I know he continues to worry about it today, trust me. <laughs> Please welcome the chairman of the Panetta Institute, Secretary Leon E. Panetta. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to uh, this, which is our fourth and last forum in this Panetta Lecture Series uh, session for this year. Uh, as you know, we've had a theme of focusing on the test of leadership in 2015, uh, the critical issues that could uh, unite or divide America. And we've had great sessions uh, talking about energy, the challenges of energy. Uh, we've talked about race relations, uh, and uh, we've talked about the economy. All of those are issues that in many ways have been debated throughout our history. But tonight's issue, cyber, is really a unique issue in the 21st century because it relates to the information revolution, development of the internet, the development of cyberspace. And as we all know, all of that tremendous technological development has great benefits to business and how business operates more efficiently and effectively, to education, to communication, and so many other areas. But at the same time, as I've described it, it can also be the battlefield of the future. Uh, cyber attacks uh, can take place now in a way that can deny service to industries that are impacted by these attacks, can exploit information, intellectual property, steal that information, uh, can uh, very much impact on personal information that we all have. Uh, through hackers and through criminal uh, activities of one kind or another. And also, a cyber attack these days could very well cripple a country. It could go after our electric grid system, go after our chemical systems, our water systems, our financial systems, our government systems. They're all run by computers. Uh, and the viruses that are being developed these days are sophisticated enough to literally paralyze a country. Those are the issues that we want to talk about this evening. 
because cyber is something that affects our security, our economy, our very lives. And we've got a very distinguished panel to be able to do that. If I can, I'd like to begin with the news of the day. Uh, because as we speak, uh, the Senate of the United States has allowed the Patriot Act to expire. Uh, the House passed one version. The Senate uh, has not accepted that, uh, tried to extend it the way it is. Uh, that ran into problems in the Senate. Uh, now they're debating the House version and probably uh, we'll discuss that over the next few days. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to pass uh, an extension at that time. But my question is, in this interim, in this gap, how dangerous is it to the security of this country to have this gap? What are the risks? And are there ways to work around uh, the fact that uh, the, the provisions of the Patriot Act have expired? Let me start with you, Mike. So I, I'm one that has uh, believed for a long time that the Patriot Act has had a lot to do with uh, the fact that we've had no repeat of 9-11. Uh, and it has its challenges. Uh, it was passed in a crisis, uh, obviously, but it has served us exceptionally well. And uh, one of the reasons that it has served us so well is because we've had tens of thousands of people working to make sure that we're not attacked again. And there have been a couple close calls. But believe me, there have been others out there who have both plotted over the last decade and continue to do that today. Uh, and, and so I think it's a very important link in the security chain, if you will, in terms of that protection. So now we're in a, we're in a more vulnerable period. It's very difficult to say exactly how risky it is, except the bad guys are still out there. They know that act has not been extended, and they're pretty agile and adaptable, and so they'll be looking for opportunities to exploit it. So I would hope that over the next few days that Congress and our uh, government leadership can figure out a way to pass a law which extends that. and. There are workarounds to a certain extent. Certainly those in government recognize the change which has occurred as a result of the, the uh, fact that the law is no longer in effect and are prepared for that, but that will also have limits. Uh, and so I would certainly hope that we haven't created a significant vulnerability over a few days and hopefully no more than that in terms of passing the legislation that we need to give these extraordinary men and women who've worked so hard for so long the tools they need to protect our country. Pete? So, sir, you know that uh, what our folks use this, this came from the 9-11 Commission, what we found after 9-11, the lessons learned, what the intel community and law enforcement needed to do to connect the dots. So these tools that were created were created with that specific reason in mind. I think over the last 14 years, almost, the intel community law enforcement has worked really well in protecting our country. That's not by accident. It's by a lot of hard work and by ensuring that these people had the right tools. You know, it's really interesting to see that all the review groups have found that everybody has done this exactly right. They followed the law, they're, they're stopping terrorist acts, and yet we still have these kinds of debates. What really causes me concern now is we know there are over 20 ISIS people, or at least that's what's been reported, in the United States prepared to conduct attacks. We're at a, as big or big a crisis as we've ever been with respect to terrorism, with what's going on in the Middle East, what we have here in this country, and we shouldn't as one senator put it, unilaterally disarm in the midst of a crisis. That's insane. I think we need to step back. It shouldn't be a debate about throwing tools away. It should be, can we do better 
with other tools, and nobody has been able to put another tool on the table. And so if you can't put something on the table, don't take it off. Figure out what we can and should do better. Come up with reasons for doing it. I think there are some provisions in the USA Freedom Act that I think are, are okay. Putting it at the carriers, I thought I was fine with that. What I'm not fine with is lapse across the whole series of these things. And I'm concerned that a couple days leads into many. Then we have something happen, and the finger pointing will start. Uh, so we, we are at a significant time right now in terms of terrorism in this country. And you know, um, you personally know how good that intel community is in stopping these overseas and working with law enforcement. And so it, it just seems almost that we politicize this for the presidential upcoming debates versus solving something for national security. Yeah, no, it, uh, we've, we've talked about this before, but uh, I, you know, I, it's difficult for me to understand uh, how the political leadership in the country could allow the United States to be vulnerable to that kind of terrorism for a political purpose. Right. Uh, it just, uh, it violates, in my book, uh, their oath of office uh, in trying to protect this country. That's what they're sworn to do. But let, let, uh, Renee, let's go on to talk about kind of the broader issue here of uh, cyber. Everybody in this audience, uh, everybody in the television audience uh, has one of the, you know, the new media kind of things, whether it's an iPhone, uh, iPad, uh, Blackberry, uh, you know, all of, all of the different gadgets that have been created. Uh, and the question, I mean, in many ways, the question is, do we take all of this for granted? Uh, we've got all of these, you know, these new toys that we have to communicate with one another. Uh, do we really understand uh, the fact that they're vulnerable to a cyber attack uh, and that information that is very personal to everybody uh, is we're able in today's world to be able to obtain that kind of information. I think we saw that in 2014, over a billion personal data records were compromised in 2014, and that was a 78% increase over 2013. How vulnerable is this audience, all of us, to the potential of a cyber attack? Well, you know, there's two sides to it. It's how vulnerable are consumers or end users of technology, and then, of course, the companies that, that take care of your records or, or provide service to you? And the answer is we are all vulnerable. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, that we have in building, you know, these, all of these devices, computers, you know, phones, tablets, et cetera, is that um, while we make them more and more secure every generation, we make the hardware more secure, we also make it more capable, um, which means that there are more things that can be done with it. Um, as we put more security into these systems, it doesn't necessarily get turned on. The history of the computing industry, which extends to the phone uh, industry as well, is opt-in, which means it's consumer, you have to decide to turn things on. That's been the history of our industry for a bunch of reasons, which means that half of the computers in the world and most of the phones go out with no security. And um, while the service providers do a very good job, most of your network service providers have security in the network, which actually blocks things from coming onto your phones. Y your tablets and computers, not necessarily. So my, you know, my, my first response is, please turn on your firewall and use antivirus, because all that does is detect and kind of do the basics as a consumer. Um, but the companies also have to prepare on their side. You know, companies like my own and, and other, you know, service providers and large multinational companies, we have to do our part too, um, which means that we all need to be investing and understanding how to improve our network security. Certainly as a multinational company, that includes our operations outside the U.S. So pursuant of your prior comment about the Patriot Act, you know, we rely on getting um, notified if something's happening to our own company 
from our government at times. So these, you know, these lapses affect private industry as much as the, you know, the government. Keith, uh, you know, you're, I think you're, it's fair to say he's the nerd in the group. I'm going to say that. Good looking, like that. Good looking nerd. <laughs> it's the makeup. It's the makeup. That helps. <laughs> this, uh, if you cover a nerd in makeup, what do you have? From, okay. From, <laughs> from, my, from my experience, and I think Mike will agree with me, uh, there was nobody that knew uh, this technology better than uh, Keith Alexander. Uh, Keith, could you define for the audience what is, when we talk about a cyber attack, what exactly is it? What, give me a simple definition of what exactly is happening when we say cyber attack. Okay, well first, I was trained at the Naval Postgraduate School, so a plug, <laughs> so a plug for the area here. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm a, ho a homie, I guess is what they call it. So, you know, it, it's a great question because we throw these terms together and everybody talks about attack. And oftentimes when somebody's in to steal something in the network, whether it's intellectual property or your records, that's really an exploit. They're getting in the network. They want to keep that network operating really well. They want to make sure everything is okay. The IT and system administrator are comfortable. And then they take what they need. Mm -hmm. The real attack is uh, two, two major types. There's the distributed denial of service attacks. Think of this as a, um, a jamming of your network. That's where they're throwing a lot of packets at the network to make it impossible for you to communicate. This happened in Estonia. It happened in other places, Georgia. There were 350 distributed denial of service attacks against Wall Street, largely credited to Iran 2012 to 2013. But the ones that cause us the greatest concerns are the destructive attacks. And destructive attacks are ones that come in and destroy either the data or the equipment, or some combination of both. A destructive attack would be what happened to Saudi Aramco in 2012, where the data on over 30,000 systems were destroyed. Ras gas a week later, South Korea, March and May of 2013, and Sony. The concern there is a combination of distributed denial of service and destructive attacks actually hit Saudi Aramco. If that were to hit our power grid and our financial sector, it would have huge consequences for the future. And what you can see by plotting some of that out is the numbers of these are increasing and the noise level in the Internet is increasing. And it's a huge concern for everyone. So we define differently the exploitation in, in the Defense Department as those things where people are trying to steal versus where they are disrupting or destroying data. But, but te technically what's happening is you develop a virus that is capable of going into a system and basically, you know, sitting there sometimes for, for months. And then somehow it comes to life and that virus is designed to do certain damage, right? I mean, that's... So on the uh, wiper virus, the way that actually works is they get in there, they set, it's almost, almost like setting up the demolitions in a building. They go in and they put all the stuff out, so they actually were in that network from June to August, so they spent 60 days. They could do it a lot more efficiently. We weren't allowed to help them. Just kidding, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> But you could be a lot more efficient by going through other devices. But they go and then they take and they issue a command from one of the central devices to execute the wiper part. So that's actually how the wiper virus works. And then there are other variants, as you know. There are ones that go out and destroy data. There are some that encrypt data. So there's a lot of capabilities. And then if you jump over to industrial control systems, there are things you can do to industrial control systems that are different by instead of attacking the data and the systems, attack the control of those systems, whether it's programmable logic controllers or other things, to destroy components or elements of the network. In the power sector, the biggest thing would be to make a surge go through the power sector, analogous to what happened in 2003 in the Northeast, that would cause the entire Northeast power grid to go down. Something like that's viable and could be done by just pushing power from one sector into another or stopping it, which is what happened in 2003. So you have all of those could be done with cyber capabilities. 
You know, it's my experience that if you can think it in this area, you can do it. And so that's the huge concern that we all have is what is the adversary thinking of doing. And I think it's not that they would necessarily want to knock down the global financial system. It's that they would make a mistake and knock down. You know, their intent was to just disrupt a little bit. And lo and behold, they disrupt, disrupted enough to take the whole, the whole yeah. grid and industry down. So, Mike, Mike let, let me ask you, Mike, uh, how, how vulnerable are we to uh, a cyber Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, a cyber 9-11 type attack? that could uh, literally paralyze the country. How vulnerable are we? I think much more vulnerable than we are willing to admit. Uh, and I'll just go uh, back to listening to Keith, who, who is a, a very unique and special geek, uh, <laughs> but also someone who's lived on the edge of this threat technologically, and who's also been a courageous leader to try to figure out what to do. And the reason I mentioned the leadership side, uh, there was a war game run up in San Francisco a couple weeks ago uh, with uh, 50 or 100 of the Fortune 50 or 100 companies. And uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, who relieved Keith at NSA, and Admiral Thad Allen, who's a retired Coast Guard chief, uh, facilitated this war game. And it was the, it was the chief technical officers or the, the CISOs, the system officers who were there. And when I heard that in a conversation I had with Admiral Allen this, uh, earlier this, or last week, that was interesting to me, but until we get the CEOs of those companies in the room so that they understand, literally understand the technology and understand the threat, we're not gonna have movement in the country or in an industry or in a company that protects a given entity from this threat. Line leaders, long gone are the days where line leaders can just sort of turn it over to the expert and say, tell me when I'm okay. Because line leaders invest in people, they set policy, and they spend the money uh, in terms of how to prevent and I, and I emphasize prevent, not just detect, this threat. And it is a threat. Keith talked about it. Leon talked about it. That could shut down uh, our way of life. I actually believe that. I don't want to be overly alarmist. But back to, I think it was 2003, you know, when the tree fell in, as I recall, in Ohio and shut down the northeast grid, we're pretty fragile. Uh, and you could pick part of our system, and I, only, I believe there's only t there are only two existential threats to us as a country. One of the nuclear weapons the Russians have, which we've negotiated over, the, over many years into treaties, which I think are, uh, contain that possibility, so that the probability is very, very low. The other is cyber. And by existential, I mean change our way of life, disrupt our financial markets for a long period of time, uh, and there is this uh, liability issue in line leaders that don't want to make decisions. I applaud, uh, I saw a story, I think it was in the journal over the weekend, the CEO of, uh, of L3, who, who owns enough of the network or is implanted in the internet to touch about 40% of the traffic that goes through it, has actually started to shut down part of his business to clean it up before he proceeds again. That costs him money, and, that, and that's not good in the, in the business sense. But I think we're going to have to have more and more of that, take that risk, rather than just hope, as the CEO of Target did, that he was okay before he gets, ex, you know, uh, he, he gets escorted out the door. But I could take those examples and move them to the country. So that's the severity of the threat and the vulnerability that we have. Renee, uh, you know, you've, you, you're there in Silicon Valley. You've seen uh, the industry up there. How well 
protected? How well defended uh, are the industries uh, that uh, you relate to? I mean, how you know? Give me a sense of how how protected are they from uh, these kinds of cyber attacks? Well, um, you know, it depends on the kind of company. In general, we we have been working. The NSTAC make, made a recommendation um, to the president about a framework with NIST around how to test how ready are you. So if I just use that framework that any company could test themselves and their preparedness, I'd say that the best of class companies are probably around 50 or 60 percent prepared on, on that scale. And what that means is they're able to detect and respond and, you know, get well, but they're not preventing. We're not in a position where we're able to, you know, really prevent a lot of this stuff. We are able to stop it. We're able to know what's happening. Um, and that's best of class companies who are spending a lot of money on thousands of products that aren't ne ne you know, necessarily integrated together. So it takes quite a bit of technical aptitude to get it right. You know, companies like the aforementioned have had these products in their companies but not implemented correctly, not necessarily turned on correctly. So that, you know, the part of it is the training. I know Keith got fabulous training, and I know they have wonderful training here. I was speaking to the provost earlier, and I was saying, you know, that kind of training we could use in private industry. We need better training to be able to get these companies up to a level. Because one of the things that I'm sure we'll come back to is that cyber is not the kind of warfare where um, it can be fought by the government alone. It's going to require partnership between industry and the government. So we need better training. We need better tools. And at some point, everyone's going to have to start to raise their level, because only the big companies are doing it right now. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue that we talked about, but I don't think it has ever been defined. Uh, what constitutes an act of war uh, in the cyber arena, Mike? Um, I think it is, first of all, a very difficult question. Uh, ironically, in 2006, when I was the CNO, I was actually looking at a war plan uh, with a country that I won't name, but we were very focused on the ISR, the, the, the surveillance reconnaissance intelligence world, and on the cyber world in 2006. And the three star that worked for me as we were looking at this O plan, I said, so, and this is sort of a hypothetical, what we would do if the war started. And he looked at me and he says, I think it already has. And that was a very sobering moment for me. Um, and certainly you could argue based on some of the attacks that have occurred, nation state attacks that I've been through, been through with Keith, uh, you could probably theoretically make an argument that it, that it could be called an act of war. Uh, that's something we've struggled with in Washington, so we don't know. Uh, I hate to leave it with this answer, but I think, I think we'll know it when it happens and we'll declare it on the spot. And it will, and it will immediately generate authorities, hopefully, a planned response that is proportional to the act at the time. I, I mean, we know from a warfare standpoint, we know how to do some of this, what the terms are, but technically how to do it is what we're learning as well. This is a two-way street. It's very dangerous for the enemy as well. It can affect their way of life. Many of them know that. Uh, I think we need to be more aggressive, uh, making it very clear to some of those nation states, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, uh, to name a few, that that's out there as well. Let me ask you, Keith, uh, somebody takes down our electric grid northeast or, you know, takes down a big grid system. How long would it take us to do the forensics to determine who's responsible? Today, it's a question of where the attack came from and where we have capabilities. Um, it could be uh, we saw it coming to we have to go figure it out. So North Korea takes time, you know, as you saw from the Sony thing, and I think it gets into this whole issue of authorities. When do you give a cyber command specifically the authorities to respond because in a 
the power grid can't reciprocate. So for NSA, Cyber Command, and FBI to actually answer the question you just asked, they have to have some way of being tipped that an issue is going on mm -hmm. at the time it's going on. Uh, since we can't have Sony attack back to North Korea, and it's going to be inherently a government responsibility because you don't want Sony starting a war with North Korea, that means, uh, and I'm sure Sony would win that. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> not, not if they're, two to one. Not if they're as bad at making movies. As That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you think about, so Sony can't attack back. That means the government would have to. A couple things have to happen. You have to have a real-time messaging framework, a near, uh, what we'll call network speed messaging framework, to have companies and government communicate. That's yes, right. So that you can say, I'm being something's happening to my network, and the government can see it and see why. And then the government has to have a standing rules of engagement that says something along these lines. This is what we tried to push after you left, uh, which was if a nation state intends to do our country harm, isn't that an act of war and does it? Um, nobody wants to put that red line on the table. That's the problem because as soon as you do it, that's the red line. They, don't, they want flexibility. But I think if a nation state intends to take down the power grid, that's an act of war. We're going to have to block it. You need to have the authorities up front. My concern is this is such a difficult area for the leadership to really get their hands around that they don't have those authorities. And by the time you can tell Cyber Command, okay, protect us, it's too late. And so you have to have done those rules of engagement like we do with NORAD up front. And this is going faster than missiles. And so that kind of uh, rules of engagement and other things should be all done. We were practicing those, but it's still not where it needs to be. Uh, Renee, let me ask you about, uh, I mean, the whole issue that kind of came up in, in the Snowden revelations is, you know, uh, the concern about privacy and, and whether the government, uh, you know, would uh, be looking at our phone calls, et cetera, and emails, et cetera. But, I mean, in... In today's world, the reality is that in the age of the Internet, there really is no privacy. I mean, you know, everything that a, that a person does on the Internet uh, obviously can be sorted out, warehoused by all kinds of global data corporations mm -hmm. that uh, gather that information, sell it to advertisers, sell it to governments, sell it to third-party data brokers, uh, the most intimate details of our lives are available. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you pick up an app of some kind, you can basically track through that app all of what a person's doing uh, and be able to gather that information. So I, I guess my point is, you know, I know we worry about the NSA gathering information, but isn't the reality that the private sector gathers a lot of information more than the NSA, and should we worry about that? Well, um, the answer, you know, from my perspective, the answer is yes. In some cases, it is accurate that uh, the private sector are gathering a lot of information. Um, I, get, I like to ask audiences when we're having a privacy discussion, how many of them, you know, use certain products, right? So in this audience, I would say, how many of you have Facebook? You want to raise your hand? Go ahead. How many of you have set your privacy settings on Facebook? I'm impressed. That's, that's better than most audiences. We, we give that away in most of these Internet applications when you click through the license. If you're using Google um, Plus and you're making phone calls using any voice over IP phone calling system, they can track every phone call. And unlike the NSA who has to do due process, you've given them that right when you click through these licenses. So I think in the privacy discussion, um, we have to start to raise the awareness of consumers on what they're already doing. You know, we're all living out loud and people are collecting this, but we're actually telling them it's okay, and then they have this data. Um, and we can't have it both ways. So I think, I think that there has to be a, a lot more of an intelligent dialogue around how do we do appropriate privacy in, you know, in a secure way. And I do believe, and I know this is not a popular belief, you can do both, but you have to give a little bit up. And the fact is most people are giving it up anyway in the way that they use their social networking today. 
Uh, Keith, uh, explain what exactly is the information that the NSA gets access to uh, through the Patriot Act? I mean, a lot of people, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not you're listening to individual conversations. What exactly do you have access to? So under the Patriot Act, Section 215 authorizes NSA to get the call detail records or business records from the Internet service providers. That's the to and from number, the date, time group, and the duration of the call. Only those four things go into the database. That's all they can have. And so those are put into a database that allows NSA to see who's calling who by number that can then tell the FBI, for example, when Zazi was in Colorado, we were authorized to look at Zazi's number, and we could go out three hops to see who Zazi was talking to and could tell at the third hop there were terrorists overseas in that that pointed to a guy in New York City. All we saw were the numbers, and then we could detect overseas the connection to terrorism. So NSA is not, there is no content, there is no voice, there is no email, it's all telephony, to from numbers. That's all the metadata program is. But more importantly, NSA is only authorized to look at it when you have a reasonable articulable suspicion that it's a number associated with al-Qaeda. You have to document that it's associated with al-Qaeda. You have to make an auditable record of that, and then that's audited by the court, Congress, and the administration. And the Presidential Review Group found that NSA had done that 100% correct. There were no impact to our civil liberties and privacy other than that which was authorized. And so the issue really comes down to how do we explain that so the American people really understand it. Some politicians will hold up their phones and say they're listening to our phones and they're reading our emails. That's not in that bill at all. That's, that's absolutely wrong. Let me ask you, because uh, a lot of this relates to the Snowden uh, revelations. Uh, Snowden, a contract employee for uh, NSA, uh, releases uh, all of this classified information. Uh, I guess uh, the question I would ask is, you know, <clears throat> well, first of all, is he a, is he a hero or a traitor? Uh, and just exactly what kind of damage has occurred to our security capability as a result of those revelations? Right. I think Snowden's a traitor, and I felt that from the beginning. <laughs> this is an individual who signed an oath, and in that oath agreed to support and defend the Constitution. Uh, and not only did he give away highly classified information, in my view, he has cavorted with the enemy to the detriment of the United States and our security. Um, I, I grew up in a big bureaucracy. I know that it is sometimes difficult to get from uh, the, the, the ranks on the floor, if you will, or in the trenches to the top. But there are very specific procedures laid out in law and in policy that if you, and regulation that if you have a problem, you can move it to the top. Uh, you, in some cases, you would call it a whistleblower opportunity, et cetera. The point is he had an opportunity to do that the right way. He did it exactly the wrong way in terms of how he addressed this issue. Uh, and so uh, that's how, obviously, I feel very strongly about it. Uh, and there are t hundreds of thousands of others who've handled this kind of information and done it well. I just think he's a traitor. If I, if I could just pick up on the damage that's been done. You know, one of the greatest honor and privileges that I had as a senior member of the intelligence community was work with our folks and other agencies around the world to go after terrorists, to bring home hostages, to do all the things that we did. In fact, one of the things when I first met then director of CIA, Leon Panetta, was to actually go through some of the terrorist things that we were jointly doing. These are great things that our folks do for our country, and it will never see the light of day. But they keep us safe, and it was an honor and privilege to do that. Here's what I'm getting from our terrorism analysts now. The amount of information that's being collected is significantly reduced because of 
because of Snowden. Terrorists are using levels of encryption and other communications that make it extremely hard, and that puts us and our allies at greater risk. And, you know, so you asked about the Patriot Act and now where we are, and with all that combined, it's the, it's the worst of all situations that we could have. Okay, let, uh, we're at the halfway mark here, and uh, what I'd like to do is to take this time, as I do, to recognize the question review team, the people that are responsible for selecting the questions that I'll present to the speakers. And if you'll hold your applause, let me introduce them. Krista Almanzon, who's the new news director for KAZU Radio. Julie Copeland, who's the city editor for the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Fran Gaber, who's an attorney with Leach and Walker and one of our veteran question review team members. Valentin Mendoza, who is the reporter with the Salinas Californian. And Lisa Mitchell, who's the online editor of the Monterey Herald. If you would thank them, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> And as we do, we have a group of students representing those who attended the afternoon student program. Incidentally, it was a program that was well attended this time of year. We're never quite sure, but we had over 300 students participate in the program. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of the students, obviously, uh, that were at the program. And I would like to ask all of the students that are here in attendance to please stand and remain standing until I recognize all of your schools. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the, four schools, the four schools that are represented are the California Maritime Academy, the Defense Language Institute, Foreign Language Center, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the University of California at Santa Cruz. This afternoon, as I said, we had a wonderful turn. You guys can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the student program is made possible because of the generous support of some very, very generous lecture series sponsors. Sylvia and I, along with the Panetta Institute Board of Directors, are very grateful for their sponsorship that allows these students the opportunity from, you know, to come from high schools and colleges and universities and military installations from throughout the Central Coast to come here and listen to our speakers discuss this kind of issue. So I would appreciate it if you would give our sponsors a hand as well. Thank you. All right, uh, let, me, uh, let me go to our questions here. And uh, the, let me ask, uh, Renee, this is probably directed at you. What is the ideal model for a public-private partnership to improve cybersecurity? Um, well, I, ideal model, you know, hang me up on that word. A model, may not be a ideal, but will be at least a starting point, would be um, a framework where we had um, the legal coverage from a liability perspective to be able to even blind data, notify uh, that something was happening to our companies, that um, share information about what we're seeing from, you know, attacks and or other activities that are happening in a bi-directional way. Um, today, if there's something that's known that might be happening to any one of our companies, the government may or may not come and tell us. Um, we're not in a position as public companies, we don't have the right coverage to really give that information or share bi-directionally in near real time um, what's happening. And that's a very important piece to the beginning of creating a defense capability or even an offensive capability where we use both what's happening to our private companies as well as to the government, which I think is going to be required in any world going forward. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly big deal to get this done, um, not only the legislative piece, but also the operating piece. I think we need a piece that says, you know, who do you call, who does what, what's the responsibility, how do we share this data, what does that network look like? Um, so some proposals have been generated around the legislation as well as the operating model, and I'm hoping that we can continue to dialogue and move some of that forward. Go ahead, Mike. The only thing I would add to that is what the country badly needs 
is a national strategy yes, in this area. I agree with that. Uh, under which you put those things that's right. that Renee's talking about. That's right. Uh, and that's got to come out of Washington, that's right. uh, which is very difficult right now because there isn't much coming out of Washington. <laughs> um, and I'm fortunate ahead in absence of that. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but, but no kidding, we need the leadership and a national strategy, right. which would then sort of give permission to this public-private relationship, which is absolutely vital to solving this problem. So, so Go ahead. Just okay. add, you know, it seems to me that the tech community, and this is where Silicon Valley and some of the great tech folks we have on the East Coast combined can come up with a technical solution that is far superior to anything that we have today. Look at that as a way of ensuring the security of companies, sectors, and industry to government set that up and ensure that any legislation helps that technical solution go forward. And I think we have to put that, because if everybody's being hacked, which is the statements that come out today, then our today's solution doesn't work. So I think we need to take a two-pronged approach, put a better technical solution on the table, and ensure future legislation supports going down that road. Uh, the Chinese have developed their own uh, computer operating systems that are closed in contrast to our open systems. Uh, how much of a disadvantage is this? Uh, while you're answering that question, what are, what are those countries uh, that are abroad that concern us, that have uh, the best capabilities when it comes to uh, cyber? I'll, I'll start and I'll, let, I'll turn it over to, the, to uh, Renee and Keith. On the technical side, um, I was in a meeting with Bob Gates, I don't know, four or five years ago, when we were actually sort of at the height of a, a pretty wicked attack. Um, and part of it then was trying to figure out where it was coming from, and it's not instantly uh, known. Um, and we weren't sure. But we know who the cast of characters are, and it's China, it's Russia, it's, it's uh, actually four or five years ago. It was not Iran. And one of the things that I'm alarmed about is the improvement in capability in Iran over the last four or five years. But Bob made a statement, <clears throat> and he's a Russian PhD, and he knows them well from the Soviet days. He made a statement that said we should never forget that the Russians have always been great mathematicians, and they always will be great mathematicians. Uh, and if you're in this space and you see them uh, operate, they're exceptionally good. Uh, uh, I, would ar I would argue certainly competing with us, and I consider us to be world class. So they're one. China is another. Uh, and I think about this again. What do you do about this? It's a two-way street. They also have vulnerabilities. Uh, China is properly and accurately accused of stealing a ridiculous amount of, of intellectual property, principally so they can keep their economy going. Uh, they have not reached a level of innovation and entrepreneurship to create on their own. They're master thieves in that regard so that they can keep their economy going at 6 or 7 percent to avoid uh, the challenges, the internal challenges, if their economy uh, is, is growing significantly at a significantly lower uh, rate than that. You've got North Korea. We've seen them lately. And, and North Korea represents a wonderful asymmetric threat in terms of stirring up our own country, stirring up our own leadership, uh, and not costing a lot of money, time, or effort. Uh, and, and in a way, I see that as they're almost toying with us with this capability. But it's a capability that can do a lot more damage than that. Uh, and those are the four, I think, that I certainly, I certainly would be focused on. Keith? Anything? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I agree, and I would say that Iran and Russia are using this to attack back when they disagree with our policy, whether it's the sanctions that we have on them for the nuclear programs or sanctions over Ukraine, Crimea, we're seeing attack back. And so Russia and Iran have one approach, and as you mentioned, China is a massive theft of intellectual property to fuel their economy. Both of those are going on simultaneous. I think Russia is by far the, the best in that group, but China's not far behind in some of their 
key capabilities. Uh, North Korea, and I would just put terrorism on here because I think we're going to see terrorism come up. You may have seen ISIS attacked uh, the French news station and knocked it down for five hours. Now, to be honest, this was something that most anybody could have done because the guy, while he's on news, on news he had behind him, his username and password <laughs> on a post-it note. And so that gave ISIS the <laughs> leg they needed. So <laughs> we have a now a post-it note that says, don't put your username and password on public TV. Uh, <laughs> but, but you see, they did keep it down for five hours. Uh, so, you know, they're gaining and they have no boundary and there's no way to actually push back on terrorism like you can a nation state actor. So you think, I mean, ISIS, of course, we know is pretty good at using social media. You, you think that they, they do have the capability when it comes to cyber attacks? Well, I think it's growing. I think what we're going to see is that start to play out in the international arena. I think as they, as you push back or we push back in certain areas, they're going to fire out. They are pulling people, uh, uh, Edwin Mullins talked about recruitment from Europe, the United States, Australia, and some of these people have technical skills. And so the issue is can you push them down far enough so they can't get access to a viable network? And the answer is not the way they're going. So this is going to come up, and the technology is doubling every two years, and they're going to leverage that. Yeah. And so I do think, you know, I think the terrorists can be as good as North Korea very quickly or better. Renee, uh, is there a cultural disconnect between military IT and civilian IT? And what can be done to close that gap? So interesting question. Cultural disconnect maybe in mindset about preparedness. Um, I don't know. Uh, many of the people who work for me and our security um, team are ex-military, to be honest. I think some of the best training um, comes from the military. Again, I would say in any way that we could train more people and leverage some of the military training for civilians would be quite helpful. Um, so maybe the mindset about um, preparedness is lost when they come into private industry a little bit, or they have a different point of view if they didn't come up through the military. But um, in general, technologically, they belong to the same communities, and they seem to you know, have a, a similar point of view on, on how to approach things. I just think the preparedness part of it is different, and I think that's the piece where we're going to have to start as private industry to think about preparedness. Because we, you know, if we can get to the point, as he says, and we get a better technical answer and the right framework to, to do, you know, the collaboration we need to do, we're going to have to be as prepared. So, and you know, we don't think that way today. Th there's no substitute for having the offense and the defense trained together. Yeah, that's right. In the past, and what industry has is the defense. They have no offense to really train with. And you don't want And we haven't, and by putting, yeah, and they probably you don't, don't want us doing offense. Yeah, right. That's right. But, okay. but I think say what. That, say that clearly. Yes. I don't want them I do not want, I don't want them to do offense. Yeah. <laughs> what, what you really want to do is make sure the defense is trained to the same level I as the offense. That. I agree with And so what we found in the military is our, is our soldiers who operated, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians who operate and defend, were trained at a much lower level than the offensive teams and cleared to a different level. And so as I recommend, one of the things that we first took on was build them and train them to the same standards, you know, because they have to be prepared to defend against a world-class adversary. And that hasn't been done, and it's very difficult for industry to understand just what that means because they're not seeing that adversary like the military and the intelligence community is. Mm. Given the uh, current divisions of authority between DOD, NSA, and DHS, Department of Homeland Security, do you think we should create a new cabinet level agency to uh, be able to control uh, and, uh, and, and improve cyber defense? No. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, the, can an, I, can the I answer. Answer. That's the last thing we need. <laughs> the, As the non, non-government person here, no. <laughs> the, answer is, the answer is not more government. Thank you. It is. It is. <laughs> we actually have the wherewithal and the talent to be able to do this. Uh, it is too often the politics and the policy that stands in the way which jeopardizes this country, in my view. That's what has to be solved. That is much more important than, than another agency. Part of the reason, and DHS has, the Department of Homeland Security, rightfully so, has the mission of protecting us internal to the country, including this threat. Uh, and obviously along with the FBI. We, there's not enough money in the world to create another agency like the NSA, which was responsible outside our borders. They have the engine, they have the technical expertise uh, that has been developed over decades. We don't have the time or the money to create something new. We have to take in my view, what we have and change it to meet the, emer the, the threat and the emerging threat. And all this, I'd like, you know, maybe Keith won't do this, but when Keith just sort of threw out, there are two terms up here, he, Keith threw out network speed, that's speed of light if you're going to get at this. And in my s simple mathematic head, there's, you know this, uh, there's a thousand milliseconds in a second. We're talking about responding in 10 milliseconds or so, not minutes or day or hours or days or weeks to prevent the damage and the attack. We're a long way away from that. We, everybody's a long way away from that right now. What are the standards? That's what government can do. They can drive us to solutions tied to that. But with what we have, not with more. So just to add to that, we had a series of meetings, uh, Mr. Secretary, we you did. know, because <laughs> we had uh, Secretary Napolitano, Secretary Gates, then you, Bob Mueller and I meet on just this topic. The Defense Department's mission is to defend the country. DHS responsibility is Homeland Security, and FBI is the law enforcement. And all of those three have to work together in this space. Making another agency would only complicate it further. We, we actually had to look at, when we built CyberCran, do we build it as a subunified, a unified, da, 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 or a separate functional command, a separate service, or, and then others posited that. And we recommended going subunified to unified for all those reasons. Uh, and stopping before going to a separate service because I thought it has to work with the service. And I think in this case, cyber, has to work with the Defense Department defending the country. It's not a separate agency in that regard. It has to be able to work with law enforcement and DHS and passing information back and forth. But if Russia were to attack this country, cyber is one element of our defense, and there would be others. And I think it's putting all that together and ensuring the integrity of our systems, and that's kind of the speech of the intrepid. Um, but you, but Keith, I think, and, and Mike and, and, and Renee, I mean, the bottom line is we haven't done a very good job at coordinating policy with regards to cyber. Uh, and, and even though we've had special assistance and we've had, you know, individuals assigned to this, the fact is that somehow this has not come together in a comprehensive approach. What, what's the problem? Actually, I'm not, I'm not completely completely sure I would agree with you on that, okay. meaning, I mean, I, at the time, we created Cyber Command uh, to, res to basically right. have this right. capability. I was, and I remain, and Keith knows this, Keith wanted to reassure me that it wasn't going to be a problem, but, you know, before this whole threat, the NSA had a mission. It was actually full-time, 24-7, yeah. uh, 365 on taking care of the American, American people outside the borders. So now we lay on, you know, what I would argue is an equally substantial mission in the cyber world, and I was worried that NSA could continue to do both, if you will, even as we carved off the cyber command 
over time. And I actually think we've done a pretty good job of that, uh, of creating it. Um, where we've struggled, and I think it's probably a natural struggle, is we've struggled with legislation. Both of you are heavily involved in that. That's not new when you're talking about, that's not, that's not a surprise when you're talking about something that's so new. We've been through a couple iteration of iterations of legislation, which is important. Uh, and, I, and I hope we can get there with legislation that actually makes a difference. That said, I think we, we're, not as, we're not as far along as I'd like to be at all. So in, from that standpoint, uh, I think we've got a lot to do, and we, and we need to recognize the speed with which we need to do it. And Washington right now is not famous for speed. Uh, and, and, and so I worry. I really do worry about that. And in that regard, I don't think we've done very well. But for what we've done in a relatively short period of time, given the threat, it's, we've actually set up a pretty good system so far with lots more to do. So, so we set this bubble chart out which said that DOD's responsibility was to defend the country. As a consequence, DOD had to have some way of knowing when industry was being attacked. FBI had the law enforcement. They had the same. And so we created that, what we called the bubble chart, which laid out the lanes in the road, which said all the technical things that had to occur to ensure that each agency uh, department could do its job. What I'm concerned as we go through the policy and the legislation is not all the people involved in those processes understand that. Yeah. And so what they confuse is that DHS's job to do this, and they say, no, no, DHS's job was to set the standards, to provide this, but it's FBI who actually does the internal law enforcement, and it's NSA or Cyber Command who does outside the country and would defend our, our nation. Renee, uh, I, I mean, this question talks about what are the biggest deficiencies in current legislation uh, or rules or operational protocols, and what should... Uh, what should this legislation look like? Uh, from, from the private sector's point of view, what, what is it that you need from, you know, in terms of legislation to try to build this public-private partnership? Well, I think I've mentioned this uh, in a prior answer that what we really have been seeking is um, some kind of liability coverage. Um, and not so much the liability, but more of a framework where we can be more open about what we might be seeing without, you know, the effect of ongoing shareholder issues and, and other litigious people coming after us, you know, because they might think that something that is not really material is more material than it is, you know, because this stuff is complicated, right? So the fact that we see, you know, any company may see 50 set attacks is that material not really because none of them got through, but it's pretty useful to know that you're seeing the same repetitive attack coming from the same place, and if you can triangulate that with other people. So the sharing of the data in addition to the liability coverage and saying, you know, what kind of data is okay, I think would be helpful um, because everybody seems to be unclear about what's, what's allowed. Um, again, I am a fan of legislation when it enables something to happen. And so my biggest concern, Keith, is right. We need different technology. So I want to reiterate that I agree with that. But we also, again, we need an operating protocol. Because as, as Keith has said, there are people who do this for their jobs every day who know, like the FBI, like the NSA, who know what to do. But there's no protocol for someone in private industry knowing what to expect. You know, in, in the case that, that Keith talked about Sony, um, there was a response, right? But that response was ad hoc because we had never completed this piece of work about if you should be attacked in this manner, who's going to do what, what should you expect, you know, and oh, by the way, show, Sony as a corporation, don't worry about calling these people because you're going to be covered because this is considered a nation state sponsored attack. So you're not, your shareholders aren't going to come after you because you called these guys, right? So that's the kind of a framework, you know, something like that that we need. And, you know, the legislation, I know you all have been way more engaged in it than I, although we've been um, in, the, you know, reviewing and that kind of thing that we need. We need help. Okay, this goes to the uh, military guys. Instead of <laughs> waiting for an attack by our enemies, wouldn't it be better to use our expertise to cyber attack our enemies 
while we have the most knowledge. Why wait for others to arm up like the Cold War? So, so no, I, I mean, I'll, I don't no, know. I think, yeah, actually, um, I think the you, you obviously you can't go attack everybody out there. Um, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't look right. And, <laughs> but but in practical reality, um, I think from our perspective. The real question is, what are they up to, why are they up to it, and what do we know? So you have intelligence collection to ensure your force understands the status of the adversary, what they're doing, and where they're going, and that you have a reasonable expectation that you can see them coming at you. We can do parts of that today. We don't have the legislation, as Renee mentioned, that we need to go to the next step. But to unilaterally go in and do that, I think that puts us in the wrong light. Because as soon as we go in and say, take out their cyber arsenal, that's an act of war, in my opinion. And what we've done is just what we didn't want them to do to us, and now we're the bad guys. And I think in this case, while that may be a future strategy that people consider, I'm not sure it's one that we would ever take. So in, a, in the construct of how do you, what do you do, uh, and I'm certainly informed by my past for an existential threat that we've all grown up with in nuclear weapons. We created uh, not just the capability, but the concept of mutually, uh, mutual, mutually assured destruction. And I don't know that that isn't relevant here. Um, and it is something that we, as a country, if we get the Russians and the Chinese to the table, let's just, or, and the Iranians for that matter, uh, on these issues to create international rules that uh, certainly both sides recognize that it's a two-way street, that's a place to start. Now, there certainly is more than just a small probability that they would cheat on that. Uh, I don't know, but I think if you get into a, a formal signed agreement that you then have an opportunity to start addressing not just the capability, but also the cheating issues. I honestly don't know where else to go. When, I, when, when we're talking about this is a capability that can change our way of life, th this can change their way of life. And so I agree with Keith. I think it would be seen as an act of war immediately, and uh, all of the responsibility and issues that are associated with that. So it would have to be, it's not impossible, but it would have to be, I think, uh, the only time I think I could see my way through that is if I sensed one was coming our way that threatened our way of life and that I would preempt. And we've said offense and defense. What's happening in this area is offense and defense and exploitation are all merging. We used to think about that as something you had time in between, and it was very clear differences. Not so. This is all very compressed space that you have to figure out what you're going to do in advance so you do it in milliseconds. Uh, and, and that's in the military, much less what do I do with Intel and Sony or our financial system as it gets brought to parade rest. Those are the challenges, and that's what... I think government and industry leaders have got to figure out to try to reconcile. Well, but let me just follow that. Uh, if, if our intelligence capabilities were, were good enough to figure out that we're going to be the focus of a cyber attack, let's say that we're, we're, we're concerned that there might be a cyber attack on our electric grid, and we're given that information, what do we do? So I think here's the way I would have handled it. I would bring that to the secretary and the president. Well, those would be the, the two. We'd lay that out just like we do all the other threats and say, here's what we got. We'd go up through the chairman and all would be put on the table. Depends on how much time you have. As I guess if you say it's, it's imminent, we, they're ready to press the button and we're going to stop that. That's where the rules of engagement would have to come in. Yeah. If you've got a few minutes, you'd call a, a video teleconference. If you've got a few days, you'd call the meetings and go up through the normal. Um, so those hypothetical things, I think, are things 
our our successors right now are working with. How do you how do you set those rules of engagement up so that you have those ahead of time, so that Admiral Mike Rogers and the team knows what they're supposed to do in this case, um, like we've done with Northern Air Defense Command. Uh, we have to have those laid out and rehearsed. You know, one other thought is, you know, does one head of state pick up the phone and talk to another head of state and say, "Make my day." We know this is coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, yeah. We could get Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood, make my day. <laughs> That's a Carmel thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Keith. <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> uh, this probably goes to Renee. Uh, what is the one most important precaution that we as citizens can take to help improve uh, cybersecurity, our cybersecurity? I would say uh, awareness and of your own uh, activities. Uh, how are you behaving online? Are you doing the basics? Do you, uh, we call it good, you know, good network hygiene, good online hygiene, meaning do you have your firewall turned on? Are you using basic um, virus detection? Are you uh, making sure that you use a product that scans so you don't go to sites that are known bad that, you know, infect? Um, do you take reasonable precaution to secure your own information? Those kinds of things, you know, personal, personal security hygiene is one thing that would be very helpful. Um, the, other, the other piece of it that we have been advocating is the computing industry in general needs to raise the minimum bar on how these devices are made and what the minimum level of security is because you can't expect end consumers to do all this themselves. Mike, you might share uh, with the audience what your wife said after <laughs> going through the discussion We're this afternoon. We're going to help her, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually, I, I don't know how concerned you are about your personal identity. I can tell you my own story. I went through uh, the Harvard Advanced Management Program in 1991 uh, as a Navy captain, uh, and uh, I called it, you know, fun for 46-year-olds for 11 weeks in Boston. But we had some extraordinary professors, and one of them was a guy named Warren McFarlane, who was one of the leading IT guys, is still, but back then, 91 now I'm talking about. And he took us through this, uh, we had him about an hour, two hours a week, and by week three or four, based on what he was telling me or telling the class, I had given up my personal identity at that point with where the technology was in 1991. Now, I live with a wonderful woman I have for almost 45 years, and I'd be nowhere without her. Uh, she, Deb still shreds everything with our name on it, everything with a number on it, as if that we're still hiding our identity from someone. So we, so we, this is actually why, while we also, how many times have you said, I agree, I agree, I agree, yeah, I agree, I agree, exactly right. I agree, that's right. you know, to get up on Wi-Fi. So yep. every time you agree, do you have a clue what you're agreeing to? No, you're just getting up on Wi-Fi. Uh, so th at a time where I actually believe it disappeared a long time ago, and I don't want to, I'm not paying, I don't want to pay short shrift to, to the, this tension between your personal identity and national security, because it's a hugely important issue. Uh, and I'm not saying we should give up on it. Um, I, th that's just where I am, and I, you know, one family's view of the world that, you know, Deb still thinks, you know, we got to protect all this stuff. I think Google knows a whole lot more about me than the NSA will ever know about me, <laughs> and I've worked there. Uh, um, so how do we as, and, and I thought it was interesting, the, the, under, the younger audience today that we had, students, right. was kind of an issue. I said, so how many of you care about your personal information, or do you care? And a bunch of them said, no, 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 I don't care. Then we said, okay, if you don't care, raise your hand. I mean, there was almost no hand. There was no public affirmation of the fact that they didn't care, even though young ones typically are a lot freer with their personal information than others. So, so this issue of, how, it's right at the center of the Snowden debate, the Per, you know, personal ID, the freedoms, et cetera, in the political debate right now. What I hope we can do is we can create a law and a policy and a structure 
that protects us, gives up enough of who we are so that we never have a cyber, we never have a cyber 9-11. Gordon England famously said, he was Secretary of the Navy at 9-11, he said they killed 3,000 on 9-11, they would have killed 30,000, they would have killed 300,000 if they could have. They're still out there. So what I would like to make, I'd like to try to facilitate and help on is can we create the right policy the right relationship with private industry to protect ourselves, similar to what we would create after a cyber 9-11, except not get there. And I don't know if that's possible. Another, uh, another issue to keep us awake at night. Uh, how, how vulnerable are nuclear power plants and other nuclear installations to a cyber attack? I'm looking at Keith. Keith, you oh. want to? I'm looking at you, <laughs> Keith. Yeah. Venture a guess here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think all of them are vulnerable. I, I mean, if you take the the statement that there are those who've been hacked and know it, and those who have been hacked and don't know it, but everybody's being hacked. I think the nuclear power, especially on the administrative side, has issues. On the operational side, I think they have taken huge steps in ensuring the integrity of those systems. That notwithstanding, the issue would probably be in the power and the electrical grids, not necessarily in the plant itself. So I think the plant has uh, good safeguards. And I equivocate a little bit here because while we say it's good, anything's possible. And so what concerns me is an adversary, a world-class adversary going after it with the insight of what they could do to create a meltdown or something else. Just, just one other quick comment on, on that, and I use the, that industry as an example, but part of what we are all challenged with right now is insider threats, yes. not just That's outside right. threats, right. insider threats. Mm -hmm. Keith talked about 20 operatives, ISIS operatives uh, inside the country right now, but those who would do us harm from inside our system, and that, in my view, is going to cause, should cause, uh, lots of leaders and lots of entities and institutions to put in place uh, policies which don't allow what I would call single access, single single person access to what could be a very fatal uh, move inside a system like a nuclear power plant. It's you need two person control in ways that we thought possibly we didn't in the past to protect against that, as well as you know, behavior watching, I mean, all those kinds of things to make sure that we're okay inside as well as worry about those, those who are trying to get us from the outside. Uh, let me ask all three of you, uh, this, you know, the, the technology we're talking about has just multiplied, developed, um, head over heel, uh, and continues to do that. Uh, you know, we're getting new stuff every year, new technologies. Uh, look at the next, uh, you know, four or five years. Uh, where is this technology going? What are, what are we what are we looking at? And is it likely to be even tougher to deal with the whole issue of cyber attack as a result of the new technologies that will develop? Renee? Yeah. Well, it's not slowing down. Um, we continue to deliver. I mean, the good news is we continue to deliver um, more compute power every couple of years than we ever have before, which is great because we make amazing breakthroughs in areas that we couldn't even think about, like specialized targeted cancer care and human genomics and all those kinds of things. The flip side of it is it gives a lot of capability to continue to evolve and escalate um, this, what has become a business in some ways, of cyber. And um, I think, and I agree with Keith on this, that we're going to have to start to look at, and many of us are pioneering the edges of this, but maybe in some more collaborative way, new technologies for dealing with it. Because what's clear is that signature-based, um, which is what, how antivirus and, and the industry has grown up, isn't going to be able to keep up. It isn't today. It's only going to get faster. And um, we see no end right now to some of this. And the encryption's getting more difficult and more complex, and 
you know, computing doesn't slow down. So one thing we can't hope for is to stop it. We need to find a different answer. Okay. Quickly. So, so I'd just add to what Renee said. I think you're going to see a shift in cybersecurity. Um, it's not clear if that will be after the cyber Pearl Harbor or if we'll be wise enough to do it ahead of that, that will have a, a new way of seeing your network, of protecting your network, of communicating within and among networks, industry to government. And I think five years from now that will be in place and that we'll have made those leaps. I think it's absolutely imperative that we do that with the Internet of Things, and so you're going to see that transformation. Mike, you've got the last word on this. Where are we going? The experts I've talked to in this is when asked, how do we fix the Internet, it's start over if you're going to make it secure. <laughs> and that's a daunting task. No one wants to hear that. But if you really want to make it secure, start over, which is scary. But, in fact, I actually believe what they're saying. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the time. <laughs> The message is, we'll start over and <laughs> do it right. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is obviously, a, it's a fascinating issue because it really does involve our lives. It involves, uh, you know, all of the technology that we're using these days. But I, I just want the public to be so aware of the fact that there is the potential here for the kind of cyber attack that we discussed that could virtually cripple this country. And I hope that through innovation and creativity and through leadership, we'll be able to prevent that from happening and to provide our children not only the greater use of this technology, but ensure that they, they have that, those, that better life that my parents cared about when they came to this country. So thank you all, and please thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.